Dr. Hussain is going to be talking about the, the newest advances in, uh, in uh, radiation therapy, uh, and, uh, well, brachytherapy specifically, and, uh, and so uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Hussain. Thank you. Well, good evening, everybody. It's a pleasure to be back here again. Uh, can you hear me in the back there? Yeah. Okay, great. So, as you know, I've been here a few times, and brachytherapy is something that uh, we've been doing here in Calgary for many years now. Uh, in fact, I started the program here back in 2003, and I've been in Calgary actually since 1999 treating prostate cancer. And I've seen a lot of changes and advances go on in prostate cancer over these uh, last 16, 17 years. So, just to talk about salvage brachytherapy, I could actually do that in just three or four slides and leave it, and that's because it's not really done anywhere else in Canada. We're probably the only center in Canada that has done this, and in terms of brachytherapy after brachytherapy, we're the only ones. There's a few uh, articles out there about brachytherapy after external beam, but that's about it. So in terms of salvage brachytherapy, it could be a very short talk. So what I've done is I know that these slides go on uh, the internet, people look at them afterwards. So I've actually put in a few more things just to remind people about prostate cancer a little bit and then talk about general recurrences, especially what we faced here in the last number of years uh, in patients who've had brachytherapy. So we'll just go through a few things and a few of these slides I'm just going to rush through pretty quickly and then I'll take time on some of the other ones down the line. So as we all know, prostate cancer is pretty bad. It's the most common cancer in men. It, the number of diagnoses has reached a peak in the late 2000s and then since then the number of uh, prostate cancer incidents has actually declined a little bit. But if we think of it, there's about almost 500 people that are diagnosed with prostate cancer weekly here in Canada and about 92 will die of prostate cancer every week. Now most of these people who die are not people who have been diagnosed now, it's people who have been diagnosed 10, 15 years ago. And if we think of it, one in eight or one in seven men will develop prostate cancer during their lifetime. The key thing about that is that prostate cancer is an age-dependent phenomenon. So as you get older, your incidence actually increases. If we think back to the last two decades, there was a huge increase in uh, the number of people with prostate cancer, and that was when PSA first came out. Since then, it's actually declined a little bit. As you can see on this slide over here, where over the last couple of decades, the incidence of prostate cancer really went up, but then it's leveled off over the last few years. And that may simply be because of all the controversies that you've heard about with PSA uh, going on. And that's another sore topic which I won't get into today, but... Uh, uh, we could talk about it at any time. So just to remind you a little bit about prostate cancer, what I'm going to do is focus a little bit on a few little issues as I go along, just so that when we get to the recurrences, it makes sense uh, uh, if you understand a little bit about the prostate uh, itself. So if we think of it, the prostate, as you can see here, is that little thing in blue, and this is me coloring here, so I'm probably like a like kid could do better than this, I'm sure. Uh, but it just gives you an idea that the prostate is right in the middle of all those critical structures. So whatever treatment we look at, there are uh, potential side effects. These are, this is again to just show you that in the prostate, there are many sections in the prostate. And these are important for us when we're doing brachytherapy because we have to target some of these specifically. And it's good for us to know this anatomy, especially if there's a recurrence down the line. It helps us to uh, isolate and diagnose these areas. This little part here around the, <coughs> sorry, the urethra uh, transition zone is an area where very rarely do we see prostate cancer. The central zone is also around the urethra but goes all the way around. And this uh, peripheral zone, as we call it, is actually where 95% of all the cancers occur. Uh, this anterior section is a critical part for brachytherapy because it's a difficult area for us to get to and if we see a recurrence this is an area that we're a little concerned about where potentially you can get a recurrence. The function of the prostate everybody knows mostly it's just to make uh, it produces fluid that helps with the semen transportation and basically uh, it, it helps because of the, where its location is it can control some of the uh, urine flow. Uh, because this is an enzyme made by the prostate, it leaks into the blood and 
as you as the prostate gets bigger you get more leakage so the PSA goes up and with cancer those cells leak more so that's why in cancer the PSA goes up uh, a little bit more uh, if we look at prostate cancer what predicts the outcome for us we all know that these things really make a difference age as we get older family history genetics diet and from our point of view from a clinical point of view the big things that we worry about of course are the Gleason score PSA and clinical stage. Now I know you probably know all about this better than I do, so I'll just sort of review these very briefly and then, as I said, move along. So the big thing with age, as I said earlier, is that as you get older, the incidence actually increases. But the critical areas are uh, less than 55 and less than 60, where we still see a fair amount of prostate cancer, and those are the ones that we worry more about because these are the people who potentially if they're going to live 20, 30 years, we have to be concerned about how well they're going to do. Uh, the elderly people, uh, it's a higher incidence, but a lot of those cancers in the elderly people sometimes are insolent, indolent in the sense that they don't cause a lot of problems. Uh, this is just a slide on all the incidences in terms of risk factors from family history. I'll just, I think most people know it anyway. Uh, so from these points that I'm going to talk about are important because not only are they predictive for the uh, way prostate cancer will develop, but also for when you get a recurrence, how well you're going to do and how well we can do in terms of managing that. Everybody knows what the Gleason score is, and it's made up of two components. Uh, it looks at the, uh, uh, if we look at it here, the grade of the cancer in terms of how abnormal the cells are. And what the pathologist does, he adds up what he thinks is the most commonest and the second most commonest to give us the score. So if you look at this, that's like a Gleason grade one where the cells look pretty normal. And then on the bottom, on the left and the right, you can see the cells don't actually even look like uh, cells at all. And that's because the cancer is going from a low grade to a higher grade cancer. Uh, PSA, the big thing about PSA is that we know that uh, uh, one, as I said, it leaks out of the prostate so it can go up. The key things that you just want to know about is that there are some things that will make the PSA go up that's not related to cancer, and that's inflammation in the prostate, any manipulation that you can have, biopsy, even sexual activity. So when you have a PSA go up and you see your PSA fluctuating up and down, don't get worried about it because there are a lot of normal things that can make that go up and down. Uh, in terms of it can go down from uh, various hormonal manipulations. We'll go over that afterwards. So the key things about PSA is your value of PSA, less than 10, 10 to 20, and greater than 20, because they help to put us into a, a risk categorization. The clinical stage is just what we feel on the prostate when you have that dastardly thing known as the uh, rectal examination. And again, if we feel the prostate in the, uh, the cancer only in the prostate, it's a low grade, if it's outside the prostate, as you can see over here, this becomes a higher grade and a more risk of this cancer spreading. And based on those, what we're able to do is create three categories, a low risk, which is where we think the cancer is confined to the prostate gland, an intermediate risk where we think the cancer has gone from the prostate to maybe just the tissues around the prostate, but it hasn't gone anywhere else, and then a high risk where we think the cancer has actually gone to uh, different parts of the body. Now by using these little risk parameters, we can actually tell you what we think to some degree, uh, sorry that the color scheme here doesn't seem to be the best, uh, but the, the uh, uh, treatments can vary depending on those groupings that you've gone into. In the low risk, uh, surveillance, as you're all hearing a lot more about, we tend to put a lot more patients on surveillance these days than we did in the past. Uh, and I'd say about in my clinic, almost about 25 to 30 percent of the people I see today were actually not even offering treatment, we're putting them on active surveillance. Versus back 10 years ago, maybe about only 5 percent of people went on surveillance. So there's a bigger push towards surveillance and that's because of the lower risk category of these people. But from a treatment point of view, you can look at any of these local treatments, prostatectomy, brachytherapy, external beam, or cryotherapy. And if we look and say, well, is one better than the other? Uh, well, there's no clear data uh, randomizing these two treatments, but there was only one study done in Europe that did randomize people to half the people getting brachy and half the people getting surgery. 
and the outcome at five and ten years was identical between the two studies, showing that brachytherapy and surgery are equivalent in terms of outcomes at ten years. The biggest thing, though, was that the people who had brachytherapy had a better erectile function uh, response over those people who had surgery. So, in terms of radiation, if we look at what changed for us over these years, is that we've changed a lot in brachytherapy. Uh, for those of you who don't know, brachytherapy actually first began in 1907, so it's been around for over 100 years. So, a lot of changes have occurred in those 100 years, as you can see here from these instruments. Can you imagine being awake and having that inserted through the urethra into the prostate and then having a radioactive element pushed through that into the prostate? That's the way it was done in 1907. So you call it a real man's treatment. <laughs> uh, but we're not as bad as that anymore. Now we actually have newer techniques that make things a lot easier and uh, it's, uh, it's easier to do. So with this template guidance system that we currently have, we have a template outside, we can put these needles through the, this template into the prostate, deposit these little seeds in the prostate, and get a nice good dose of radiation around the prostate. A lot easier than what we used to do in the past. Why does brachytherapy work? Oh, I'm sorry that this color schemes probably don't seem to work well with, the, with, with this thing here, but what you can see here is that the, I don't know if you can read it very well, if you take prostate and you take the cancer here, in most of the cases, the cancer has only come out a little bit around the prostate. And in 90% of the people, it only comes out to about this far outside the prostate in the low and the intermediate risk category stages. When we do brachytherapy, the radiation dose we can give can come out to this distance. So the advantage is that not only do we treat the cancer in the prostate, but we treat the cancer that is extended out uh, uh, into this tissue around here which is why it works so well. So you can see here that the, uh, where we talked about where the cancer just outside and the radiation beam comes out or the radiation from the brachytherapy will come right to this distance here. So that's why it's, uh, it, it's effective. And when we look at this, if we go back to the past and say with external beam, uh, when we first used to do it, the biggest problem was we couldn't give a high dose of radiation. So the recurrence rates within the prostate were very high, almost 40% of people would get a recurrence in the prostate. And that's why radiation therapy didn't have a good name in terms of prostate cancer management. But over the years, as we've been able to increase the dose, the recurrence rates within the prostate have dropped down to about 5% with external beam. And with brachytherapy, we're at less than 1% for a recurrence within the prostate itself. And that's because of the much higher dose of radiation that we can give. If we look at techniques also as to how it was done, just to show an advancement, this is how it was done in the mid-1940s, where this, you would put the seed needles in through the abdomen. So you would actually have surgery, open the abdomen, put the needle in, and this would have to be a student's finger because uh, <laughs> we, we don't mind students getting poked by needles, right? And then when you would feel the tip of the needle, you know that you've gone deep enough and you would deposit the seeds in like that. So not really the best way to do it. And you can see here that the problem is you couldn't see what you were doing. So when you couldn't see what you were doing, you ended up putting seeds all over the place and you got a lot of hot and cold spots and as a result, uh, the, there was a lot of recurrence of prostate cancer because you weren't putting the dose where the cancer was. So that's why it was good that you don't walk in front, right? It's good to be the second guy on the list, as they say. Uh, and then further modern advancements, which we've done here in Calgary, we've gone from a pre-planning system where you come in, have an ultrasound, and then you, we plan on that ultrasound. A month later, you come in and have the implant done. You try and match the image to a little bit of images here uh, and what you're doing inside the operating room. So it's very difficult to do. And what you do is you look for a little point in the prostate and you try and put a needle in right over here. So that's the way it's done actually in most centers. Calgary, when we started in 2003, we went to this intraoperative system so we could design something that was a lot more easier to do. So we went to a computer-generated system and we helped develop this over the last 10 years to the point where everything now is done inside the operating room. We can create a 3D model of the prostate inside the operating room. And with that, we can then decide where we want to put the radiation inside the prostate while you're asleep on the, on the bed and then deliver the radiation dose exactly where we want. We, we developed this system where we could 
track where the needles are going into the prostate. So, uh, and then we could put the needle in, as you can see here, exactly where you want to go. And once the needle is in place, we can drop the seed exactly where we want it to go. So this is a program that was developed here in Calgary. And then we actually taught this to a lot of Europe where, who has been using this over the last 10 years. So this became known as the Calgary Technique in Europe, actually, because uh, of our development. So you can see the big change from going from visualization like this to what they used to do where you just look for a little dot. So as you know, who's eligible for this treatment? Basically, uh, it's all the people with the low and the low intermediate risk categories. So now we can get to the topic that we actually wanted to talk about, which was just recurrence. So if you've had treatment, what do we do if you do get a recurrence? So the first thing we can do is define what do we mean by a recurrence of prostate cancer. So if you, and that's it, because it's different if you've had surgery or it's different if you've had radiation treatment. So if you've had surgery, if your PSA is even detectable at a value of about 0 0.2, then that indicates that you've got, got a recurrence of prostate cancer. And that's partly because there's no prostate in the body. So 100% of the PSA that's being made has to come from cancer cells that were outside the prostate at the time of surgery. And as they're growing, uh, they develop a little bit of a PSA. And so that tells you it's cancer recurrence. For radiation treatment, it's a little bit more diff difficult because uh, with radiation treatment, there's a prostate in place. With the radiation that we give, we kill m most of the prostates, all the cancer cells, most of the prostate, but there's a little bit of residual prostate that gives you a l very small PSA value. So what we look for is there are two definitions. One is that if we get three consecutive rises, or if we get a PSA that drops to a bottom value and then rises up to two points above that level. If we reach those parameters, then we say that you've actually got a recurrence of your prostate cancer. And that's because a lot of people, will, the PSA will bounce up and down a little bit. So if it's bouncing up and down, that doesn't mean to say that you've actually got a recurrence. The next thing we want to know is if you've got a recurrence, where is the cancer? Is it only inside the prostate, if you've had radiation, or if you've had surgery, is it around the prostate bed? The word regional means that is the cancer outside the prostate, but in a little bit of the lymph node areas, and systemic means that it's gone to the bones. So in a simple way, if you look at this, if we take this part of your body, if the cancer recurs in here, the green is the normal lymph nodes and the blue is the uh, recurrence of the cancer. So if you see it in this area over here, we call that a regional recurrence. So that's still amenable to potential cure. However, if it's distant and gone into the bones, as you can see over here, then that usually becomes a cancer that we can't really do very much about it, except for trying to control it as much as possible. And local would be just within the prostate itself over there. So these, this is important for us because if we, uh, uh, when we're looking at the prostate, we have to decide what it is we're going to do. Um, so uh, does a rectal exam actually help? Well. There's a lot of controversy over that, especially when Mr. Happy's around, as I say, right? So, uh, and that's because we don't do rectal exams as much as we used to do to look for uh, recurrence in the prostate, and that's partly because we've got so many other tests now that the value of the rectal exam may not be as good as what it used to be in the old days when we didn't have these things. So what we look for, again, if you go back to the beginning and see the slides that I showed you at the beginning in terms of how we categorize prostate cancer by PSA, stage, and Gleason score. Again, if you get a recurrence, it's very important for us to know those parameters both pre and after surgery because they can help tell us what the chances are that the cancer is local or what the chances are that the cancer has gone to other parts of the body. The doubling time of the PSA is also important for us because if you've got a very rapid growing process, uh, doubling time, it means the cancer is growing rapidly. If it's growing very slowly, then it tells us it's a slow recurrence and usually we can wait a long time before we have to do things. And time to recurrence is another parameter that we look at. So, so what we need to know is if we're going to look at re uh, treating a recurrence is what your initial treatment was. And again, three parameters in terms of where the cancer is. So how can we decide where the cancer is when you start getting a recurrence? So the first thing, of course, is if we think it's local, we can repeat a biopsy. Uh, the PSA will tell us to some degree if whether we think the recurrence is. If you've got a low PSA, more likely the cancer is confined to the prostate or the regional areas. 
and the high PSA suggests that the cancer is actually spread beyond the prostate and into the distant areas. A rapid lobbing time, as I told you, is also important. An MRI is something that is new that we've been doing here in Calgary because we developed, we got this new three Tesla MRI at the South Campus. And until then, we didn't ha actually have this MRI. The old MRIs that we had were not very good at being able to diagnose prostate cancer because you couldn't get a good image of the prostate cancer. This new machine actually gives us very clear images of the prostate. We also do these scans to help see where the cancer is. So when we're looking at the lymph nodes, it's important for us to see that typically the cancer will start here and then will gradually spread up through the pathways of the lymphatic chains like that. And this is an MRI of the prostate showing that what you can see over here is a lymph node recurrence that's only isolated in, the, in this one area. So this is a person with a solitary recurrence in the lymph node. And this is a patient that we had, which I can tell you what we did for him afterwards after his brachytherapy when he had a recurrence. This is unfortunately what a bone scan looks like when you've got recurrence that's gone to other parts of the body. All these black spots tells us that this is cancer having spread to these areas. And you can see that the cancer is spread in this gentleman quite a bit. But would you believe this image is the same patient after treatment with uh, today's chemotherapy. So that's how well, even despite everything that we're doing, we can actually do quite good for prostate cancer with the current uh, uh, drugs and everything that we have. So not only do we look at local recurrence, but distant recurrence as we can do more with today. This is a three Tesla MRI, and what you can see over here is that this density spot over here is actually a recurrence that you can see in the prostate. And this part here, remember I showed you about the zones of the prostate, that top part of the prostate? So this is an unfortunate area where you can see prostate recurrence after brachy because sometimes that, dose, that area of the prostate can be a little bit underdosed. This is a recurrence in this part of the prostate over here, which is on the side of the prostate. So the advantage of this type of MRI is that not only can we get a good image of the prostate, but you can see actually areas just outside the prostate where the cancer is actually just spread outside. So if we're doing uh, something like brachytherapy or salvage treatment for, for people with this, we can now tell where the cancer is, which helps us to uh, target those areas at the, uh, with our treatment. And this is the difference between what a CT looks like, where if you look at this half of the body seeing a CT, and this half of the body showing the MRI. On the CT, this is the prostate, which really doesn't show us anything. But if you look over here, you can see the prostate and these white dots are actually areas of recurrence. So this is the advantage of the new MRI system that we currently have. So what have we done here in Calgary over the years? So just to share a little bit of data with you because we're, out, we're going to be publishing this data actually hopefully in the next couple of months. So we started the program back in 2003. So between 2003 and 2013, we've treated 822 patients. And up till the end of 2015, we've done over 1,000 patients. Uh, we've actually, in our 12 years of uh, treating this now, we've actually had 40, 45 people with recurrences. And that's about 4.4%. So it tells us that we're almost got a 95% cure rate over a 12-year time period with, uh, with the BRAC therapy. Unfortunately, we've had about 63 patients die over these 12 years, but none of them have died from prostate cancer. They've all died from other causes, such as heart attacks, um, other neurological problems, and a few of them have developed other cancers not related to prostate cancer in any way, but have died from those recurrences. If we look at an average survival, we actually can't even calculate an average survival yet because we haven't reached that time period, which tells us the average survival has to be greater than uh, 10 to 12 years. If we look at a, an estimated uh, survival risk, we'll say that it's about 91% for some of the low risk. For the intermediate risk, uh, we've not been doing as well with about a 70% cure rate. And if we look at uh, uh, the graphs over here, you can actually see that the low risk do really well and the intermediate risk up to seven years does very well. And the reason it may not show it good at 10 years is partly because we don't have enough patients going out that far. But with external beam, if we treat patients, the cure rate at 10 years, unfortunately, is only around 40 to 50% in most cases. So even on an average with external beam, the results with the intermediate risk prostate cancer is not very good. 
So in our case, what have we had? We've had the 45 recurrences. Now, nine of those have actually been within the prostate only. 36 have been outside the prostate. What we've done for treatment, 10 people so far have actually not had any treatment whatsoever. So despite the fact that they've got a slow recurring prostate cancer, we're just monitoring them and when their PSA goes up to be a higher level, we'll start them on some treatment. We've got about 23 on intermittent hormonal therapy. Three people we've had with this isolated lymph node recurrence. And you saw that time where I showed you that MRI where you could see that one lymph node. And two people have actually had surgery. And we've done this thing called salvage brachytherapy on seven people so far, which is the biggest number of people done in any center across uh, North America at this point from what we're aware of. So we first defined that the recurrence is within the prostate or just outside. And there's n unfortunately, there's never any symptoms associated with this. It's usually all just based on the PSA that, go, that comes uh, on an analysis. So we'll, we all go, always go through a full step on people if we see a recurrence to determine where we think the cancer is. So if the PSA is rising, then we'll do a biopsy followed with uh, bone scan CT, and then the last step is to do an MRI to evaluate where we think the prostate or the cancer is in the prostate if we're going to consider doing something like salvage brachytherapy. Uh, if all the criteria are met, then we can potentially look at doing something for that. Now, since the recurrences are relatively rare, as we said, and we've only had nine over 12 years, there's really no data out there in the literature or in the world as very much in terms of what to do for these people when they get a recurrence. So uh, the problem with surgery that's very difficult technically and side effects are actually relatively high. Uh, and until just recently, there was nobody really doing br uh, salvage brachytherapy for these patients. So if we look at this uh, topic of salvage brachytherapy, as I said, I could do it in a few talks because, or a few slides because there's really very little information out there. So if we look at brachytherapy in general and say what has been done for brachytherapy in uh, other cases for after external beam, because after external beam, if you saw that there was a lot of people who used to get recurrences, recurrences are actually also going down. But there is a, a few data or a little bit of data out there on patients who or people who've done bra brachytherapy on these people after external beam. The old concept used to be you couldn't do anything. But because of modern technology and the way that we can actually target a few things, we can do brachytherapy for some of these external beam patients. And we've actually done uh, salvage brachytherapy on two patients who've had external beam and then had a local recurrence. But we've done more on the people with brachy at this point, and that's partly because we don't get the referrals in from the external beam patients. So there are now, uh, only a few studies, and you can see here, there are only a few studies out here and the number of patients in each uh, grouping has actually been relatively small. And uh, if we look at one study here, this is using HDR brachytherapy, not LDR brachytherapy. And HDR is actually where you go in, you put a high dose of radiation into the prostate, and then you take this, uh, the radiation out so you don't leave the radiation in with the patient. The low dose rate brachy is where we put the seeds in and the seeds stay in permanently. So there's a bit more data out there for this type of salvage for after external beam. But again, uh, if we look at the results of that, uh, it's still at about five, five years. The results are at about 60 to 70 percent uh, cure rates with, uh, with doing that. So in other words, if the recurrence is only in the prostate, you can do well. If the recurrence is outside the prostate, unfortunately, this treatment doesn't help very well. There is one other case for an uh, article that I found doing salvage low dose rate brachy after external beam, though not after brachy uh, itself. And this was again using a bit of targeted uh, brachytherapy for the areas of re recurrence. Unfortunately, because they only had five patients in their series, they did not report any outcome on these patients. So unfortunately, we don't know how they all actually did. Again, an, uh, another uh, paper looking at this, which again looks at 10-year survival. And this is using brachytherapy after external beam. At five years, recurrences are, uh, are cure rated 64%, but at 10 years, uh, it's 50%. So about half the people can still get cured by having a salvage brachytherapy procedure. And again, in this big article, 
again, at about 10 years, we're looking at a 50% uh, cure rate. So in other words, we can still cure a few people with this. But what about surgery after uh, external beam? We all know the answer has never been, you know, we don't want to do it. The surgeons will say, no, it's too difficult to do. And in Canada, there's really nobody doing surgery after external beam. But there is one data set out there in the U.S. and somebody who's done uh, about 100 cases of people with external beam. This is probably about 5, 10 years ago. Um, and unfortunately, the results were not very, very good with surgery, which is part of the reason why most people do not do it. If we look at the cure rates out at about 10 years, we're looking only at about 30% of patients being cured uh, with surgery after brachytherapy, uh, after uh, external beam. And that's partly because if you get high-risk features, they do very poorly. In other words, if the cancer is outside the prostate at the time of uh, uh, trying to do salvage, you cannot do very well. Only if the cancer is confined can you do well. And again, if we look at this where we can look at the uh, risk factors again, if you've got a high PSA or, as we said, uh, uh, a, a low PSA at the beginning and a high PSA at the beginning, it shows how poorly you can do or how well you can do if you've got a low PSA. So in these few data sets, they did try and compare on a multi analysis of all these uh, between these three different treatment types for recurrences in terms of how they measured up. If you look, surgery had a 41% incontinence rate after external beam. Brachytherapy was only 6%. Uh, bladder neck stricture was about the same in all of them. Uh, but rectal damage was a little bit higher in the brachytherapy group and you didn't get any rectal issues with the surgical groups. So based on that, when, when we start seeing recurrences here in Calgary, we try and decide, well, what is there to help us decide what is the best thing to do for these patients? So since there was no data on people uh, who, uh, who had a recurrence in terms of what to do, we had to be innovative and design our own uh, treatment protocol for, for, for our patients. So as you heard me say, we had three that have had regional disease and nine that have had uh, um, local recurrences only. So for those people with regional disease, the option was one, we can just treat with hormones and leave them be and say, you know what, we can't cure you. But we decided that we wanted to be different and try and do something for these people. So we decided to look at these people carefully and see was there any potential cancer anywhere else. So we don't have good PET scans here in Canada at this point in time, unfortunately, which helps to uh, look for recurrences uh, more accurately than even what our uh, MRI and CT scans will do. So we send these patients, uh, uh, a few patients to Phoenix and to Kansas City for this type of uh, PET scanning to be done. And on these PET scans, as you can see, you can see an isolated recurrence in this area over here in this one patient. And you can see isolated recurrences over here in this patient over, uh, uh, down here. So with this in mind and seeing that there was no evidence of cancer in any of the bones or anything, we decided to do uh, a treatment on these people in terms of we couldn't do salvage because we did a biopsy and there was nothing in the prostate. The recurrence was only in the lymph node itself. So we designed something with targeted external beam radiation therapy where we could shape the radiation dose around the area of recurrence, around the lymph node areas over here, and keep the areas to the prostate and the bladder very low so we could, in a way, shape the radiation around the area where the recurrence was in an effort to try and cure these people. Uh, and as you can see over here, we could shape the radiation dose around here keep the radiation dose down over here, and target the areas that we wanted with the radiation. So this is all new because the newer machines we have now with external beam that we can do some of this. So with these three people, unfortunately, one person did develop a, a further recurrence one year later, and he's on hormone therapy. But two people at this time, out of the three that we've treated with this isolated lymph node recurrence, are still cured and they've been cured with no other treatment apart from just this radiation therapy. And they've actually done very well with very little side effects. So this is actually very new. No one's ever done this before. So this is uh, something that we can actually potentially write up in terms of uh, being innovative on, uh, on these patients. So what about uh, 
uh, you heard me say there were two patients who had surgery. There's nobody in Canada doing surgery for patients after brachytherapy, but these two patients really wanted surgery, so we sent them actually to New York. And uh, there's a surgeon in New York who's been doing a little bit of uh, surgery for these patients uh, after recurrence of brachytherapy. So both of them had it done there. From a PSA point of view, both are actually doing very well. But from a side effect point of view, unfortunately, both of them have got significant urinary problems. One is incontinent two years later and still wears a pad. And the other gentleman is not able to avoid it all. He developed a stricture there and uh, is doing self-catheterization to, uh, to empty his bladder. But his prostate cancer is cured, but unfortunately, they do have these type of side effects afterwards. So what about salvage brachy? Come back to that little topic that we wanted to talk about. And uh, so in Calgary here, we're actually publishing our paper on this because we've treated seven people so far uh, with brachytherapy. So this is just our paper that we're actually putting out for publication now on this. So on these patients, what we've looked at is, uh, if you look at the uh, categorization, the Gleason scores at the beginning were six and seven, and uh, with the first implant, but at time of re-implant, almost all the people have had a higher grade uh, prostate cancer. So in other words, when they developed a recurrence, the recurrence in the prostate cancer was a bit of a higher grade. And if we look at the number of cores that were positive, each of them actually had about two positive cores. Uh, and with all the other investigations we did, we couldn't see any cancer anywhere else. So we decided again to be very innovative and say, let's try and do a repeat brachy on these people. Because now we know where the recurrence is, we can try and target with that. We also looked at the dose to make sure that we didn't underdose any of those patients. And if we look at them, all the patients that are here, if we look at the dose, doses that we gave the prostate, they're all actually very high. The average dose out there that most people will give patients is about 140 uh, units of radiation. And between 140 and 160 is what it ends up to be. And if we look at these, almost everybody got between the lowest was 177 and the highest was 202 units of radiation. So none of these patients were underdosed in any way inside the operating room. And more likely, because the grade was different at the time of recurrence, this was either a new prostate cancer that developed over time. Um, and uh, so we decided to try and do something more for these patients. And over here, we can see where the recurrences were inside the prostate. So what we did was we developed a scheme where we looked to see where the uh, uh, where we had done the brachy in the first place and then said what we could do is try and do targeted therapies. If we've got a recurrence over here or here, maybe we can just do radiation in only isolated spots of the, of the prostate. And what we developed was a technique where we went, took these patients back to the operating room and we designed the radiation to only go to a certain part of the prostate as you can see over here. And we could, be, we, knowing where the cancer was, we targeted the radiation specifically to those areas, and we didn't put radiation in the other areas where, the, uh, uh, where there was no cancer. So in each different patient, you can see that the cancer was in slightly different areas, so we targeted only those areas with uh, the radiation. And what you can see here is that this orange uh, outline is where we're giving the high dose of radiation. The blue outline is mostly what we wanted to concentrate around. So all the radiation is concentrated in this one area, a little bit being pulled over here because we saw a little bit of cancer on the outside over here. So in this patient, the recurrence was on the other side of the prostate, so we treated only that side of the prostate, as you can see over here. So these dots are where the radiation seeds went in to try and deliver the radiation dose that we wanted. In this one gentleman, he had a recurrence in the seminal vesicles as well as the prostate, so we were able to target that part of the seminal vesicles with the radiation, as well as curve the radiation around the urethra over here to try and preserve the uh, uh, radiation dose to the urethra and yet maximize the dose to the areas where the tumor was. And by doing that, uh, uh, we also actually, sorry, I forgot to say that and should have put this first, sorry. So in this patient, actually, we had the MRI done and we can see here this white area that we, we have here is the area of recurrence. And this is that top part of the prostate that I mentioned. So when we, when we put the radiation dose in this patient, you can see here that we targeted the top part of the prostate 
uh, fully with the radiation and just this one side because of this little dots of uh, recurrence around here. And this is what the implant looks like afterwards with both the original seeds in there and the seeds that we put in the second time around. So this is just, uh, it's, this may be a little bit difficult to follow, but this is just a graph showing each of the people that we've treated, all seven people. And what you can see here is that at each point, like this patient over here, this is where he had his second implant, and you can see his PSA has come down completely. This patient here in green had his second implant over here because this is the PSA rising showing his recurrence, and this is the PSA coming down here. A third person here had a, you can see his PSA at the beginning coming right down, then it rolls over here, so we implanted him at this point, and this is his PSA coming down here. One patient down here, where again he was treated down here, PSA looked good, rising up over here. We did that second implant, and his PSA has come down. This gentleman here had a pretty big rise in his PSA, but look after his implant, his PSA has come down, it's actually d staying down at this point down here. This other one, unfortunately, this one gentleman here who we implanted, his PSA was here, didn't come down very well, but his PSA started to rise, so we did a re-implant on him. PSA came down, but unfortunately, there's a bit of a rise in his PSA at this point in time. And we have one other gentleman who has a slowly rising PSA following the second implant. So this just shows that the pattern of the PSAs in everybody is quite different, but following that second implant, there's been a good drop in PSA in the majority of these people. And if we look at their urinary scores, this is, if we just think of something like here, this is a hard thing to look at, but think of these as being their initial baseline, and this is their initial baseline, or this is their scores after one and a half to two years. So most of them have gone up a little bit, some have come back down to original aspect, but a couple have stayed up a little bit higher, showing that despite trying to do this targeted implant, we have uh, still a few urinary symptoms. And two of those patients actually went on to have what's called a mini rotor rooter done, just to open up the passageway a little bit. But since then, they've actually done very well and no other problems. Their prostate cancer is actually quite uh, controlled. So in essence, we've re-implanted seven of these patients. Five of them are doing very well with no evidence of uh, a rise in their PSA, giving us about a 71% cure rate at this point. We have two that have got a slowly rising PSA, and at this time, we're just uh, keeping them on surveillance. We actually haven't done any treatment or anything for them. So basically, uh, in summary, that's all that I really had to say. As I said, salvage brachia I could do in a pretty short time period because there's not much in there. But the beauty is that this is something that I think we can look at down the line. We know that the recurrence rates may be about 1%. And I think this shows us now that we can actually do something for somebody if they've got an isolated recurrence. With all the new technology we've got with the scanning systems, the new MRI, the PET scans, we can confirm that the cancer is where we think it is, and that allows us to be more targeted and be more aggressive on trying to cure these people. So I think this is a big difference from back 10, 15 years ago, that if you got a recurrence after any of these treatments, we would say, you know what? There's not much we can do for you, goodbye. We'll just follow your PSA and then treat you with hormone therapy and not try and cure you, but we'll try and just control your cancer over the years. We're now actually able to go back and say for a lot of these patients, you know what? If you want, we can try and be aggressive and we can try and cure your cancer still, even at time of recurrence. And this data shows that we can do it relatively safely in people and at the same time, a 71% cure rate for a recurrence is actually, I don't think, very bad at this point in time. So I think we've made big strides over the last 15 years that we've been doing this. We're the first ones in, in Canada, probably in the world, to do repeat brachy after brachy. And I think our publication that will go out there will help others to look at this also as a potential a treatment option for their patients when they get recurrences and not just sort of say to them, you know what, we can't do anything for you. So. Um, uh, with that, I can leave it open to any questions or anything else, and I always keep saying, we're looking for that dastard liqueur, but don't want to, as somebody said, we don't want to lose our funding <laughs> on some of the research work that we're doing. All right. Very so, nice. great. All right. Just before questions, uh, I'm, I'm always impressed, uh, one, by the, the new technology that, that comes along and, and also by the, the amount of research 
that's going on, uh, not just in Calgary, but generally in, in Alberta and, and of course throughout Canada and, and, and the world internationally. Uh, all, all of which leads me to, to think that uh, I was diagnosed with prostate cancer too early and, uh, and uh, you know, to take advantage of these, uh, of these new developments. But anyway, uh, enough of me and uh, questions for Dr. Singh, please. Sure. Can you speak to, uh, for bracket therapy, the rectal cancer risk? Oh, yeah, the, at this point... Second off, sorry, with bracket therapy, is there a hormonal treatment that occurs for the three months thereafter, or is that optional? Okay, two things. One, at this point, there's no data out there in terms of rectal cancer and prostate brachytherapy. Uh, nothing that's actually been proven in any aspect, either with brachytherapy or with external beam. Um, so that's still up in the air. We don't really have much data on that at all to, to say anything. In regards to hormonal therapy with brachytherapy, there are two reasons to really use it. One is uh, to downsize the prostate only uh, in the sense of uh, if you've got an enlarged prostate gland and you want to have brachytherapy, part of our limitation is that we have a size limit that we can do. And that's because the shape of the pelvis that sits like this the prostate has to fit within the pelvis for us to be able to get the needles there. If the prostate is bigger, then we can't get needles into it. So to shrink the prostate down, we use hormonal therapy on an average for about three months in people to downsize the gland. And then once the uh, prostate gland is shrunk, we'll go ahead with the brachy. Uh, do we use it for people uh, with more advanced prostate cancer? We've been doing it for some people. Um, if they've got a little bit more advanced cancer than what we'd like to see them have to have brachytherapy. But there are a lot of people who unfortunately who would like to have brachy but don't quite meet the full criteria. So we know with external beam that if we add hormonal therapy on that it, um, it helps to improve the outcome with external beam. So we've done that in a few patients that have uh, been outside our sort of limits to see if we can help control the cancer a little bit better in them. But what we're going to be starting is another new program here in Calgary in the near future where instead of adding the hormones on, we're actually going to do a combination of external beam and brachytherapy for people with a little bit more advanced prostate cancer. And even the high-risk prostate cancer that we sort of don't do very much for, we're going to be looking at doing a combination of horm uh, external beam and brachy with a short course of hormone therapy to try and help cure the cancers. Send it to you. Uh, so how do you keep the pellets or whatever they are in, in one place because they're moving around? And secondly, what, if you can do it in the prostate, why can't you do it like on the liver or something else like that? Good question. Uh, actually, uh, one, uh, <coughs> with what we do when we put the, the, the seeds in, there's enough scarring that occurs right around the seeds that they don't move. So the, the, there's enough scarring that occurs around the seeds. Once the seed goes in, there's a bit of inflammation that occurs there, so the seeds tend to stay in place. In the first few hours, they can move a little bit, but then after that, they tend not to move very much at all. Um, in terms of doing brachy seeds for other sites, uh, yes, actually, we've actually started to, to look at that as a technology. We did try it in brain tumors where we implanted these radioactive seeds, and the picture you actually saw of me at the beginning on that salvage brachy that they had was me actually starting a new program here in Calgary, which I uh, started about two years ago. I got some funding where for breast cancer, we were, instead of doing the five, six weeks of external beam for people with breast cancers, can we implant these radioactive seeds to, uh, to cure their breast cancer? So, so far we've treated about almost 30 women with this in Calgary over the last year and a half, and so far they've all done very well. In terms of side effects, it's great because they don't get all the skin reaction and everything that they get with the external beam. So it is slowly going out and being used in other cancer sites. Uh, but again, it's a learning process and we have to do it slowly. So right now we've started this. We've developed something very new with the breast cancer uh, treatment at this point. So we're looking forward to the outcomes on that over time also. Or, okay. Um, I've read that that with bracket therapy, patients can experience something called a PSA balance. Yep. Can you speak to that? Yeah, that's actually a well-known phenomenon. Even with external beam, you get that a little bit, but it's not as uh, 
prominent. So in brachy, we see that quite often the PSA will come down, then will go up and come down and bounce up and down a little bit before it comes uh, settles down. And the reason for that is that you have to think of how the radiation works. The radiation works by killing the cancer cells, but the way it kills the cancer cells is it actually kills the DNA, so the DNA can't make duplicates of itself. But the cell will live its normal lifespan. So as those cells die off at different time periods, as soon as they die off, they leak more PSA into the bloodstream. So the PSA bounce that you see comes actually from all these cells dying out and leaking PSA into the, into the bloodstream. It's not because of cancer, it's because of cells dying that actually causes that bounce. So it's good to see those bounces occurring in some cases because they do reflect that there's more cell death. I've seen a bounce as high as 22 uh, in one person and as high as 19, but then it came right down afterwards to zero and that patient has had a PSA of zero ever since. Does so, that occur within a three-month period? It usually occurs within the first two years after the brachytherapy because of the half-life of the radiation seeds. So somebody had a question. Yep. Or? Go ahead, Paul. Okay. You showed us examples of using PET scans or the MRI to look at recurrent cancers. Can you comment about those tools to look for the primary cancer? Yeah. Well. That's a good question because, the, uh, and it's a hard one to really answer because it comes down to a mixture of healthcare dollars, resources, and everything else. Um, when we're looking at uh, low risk prostate cancer, a little bit of intermediate risk prostate cancer, we kind of know where the cancers are in most of those patients. Uh, we have done some studies looking at all those MRIs and PET scans in people to see can that help us in targeting them for initial therapies. And the problem is it's not, it, it doesn't add a lot to what you're going to do. If you're going to do brachy for that person, you can do brachy uh, because you're going to treat the whole prostate anyway. If you're going to do surgery, you're going to remove the whole prostate anyway. Uh, if there's a risk factor, if we think that there's a bit more of a risk factor, then we do do it. I do it in people with intermediate risk prostate cancer that I'm going to do brachion. I now do an MRI on almost everybody before we do brachion them, and that's to look for a location of the tumor because if there's location in that upper, uh, top part of the prostate, then when I do the initial brachy, I can target that area well on that. But for external beam and most of the treatments, it's not very helpful. If we look at bone scans and CTs, uh, for people with intermediate risk disease, the chance of you picking up a positive bone scan or any of those things is about 1%. So 99% of the time, the tests are going to be negative. So to do all these great tests, um, when we know that 90% of them plus are probably going to be negative, doesn't turn into a big cost-effective mechanism and would really push resources to the limit in terms of what we could do. I think there are select cases where they're useful, and we do use them in those select cases, as I mentioned to you. The, now, a lot of those PET scans we can't do in Canada, by the way, so we've been sending them to the States. So these patients that I've sent to the States, the cost for them to have those scans is the one in Kansas City is 2500 US dollars. The one in Phoenix is about 1,800 to 2,000 US dollars. That's just for the scan. You referred to uh, using a biopsy as the uh, condition precedent to do the salvage tracking. Um, most of us are familiar that the conventional diagnostic uh, prostate biopsies are, are done on a random basis, um, and they may or may not uh, find what, what, what needs treatment. Are, are the biopsies done, um, precedent to salvage brachy, uh, done in a different way, in, in a, uh, a less random way? Uh, because it's fine if you treat what you find with the biopsy, but what, what about what you miss? Yeah. It's always a good question because there's always uh, a concern there when we do that. So we actually do the MRI first in some people. So if we see uh, an area where there's recurrence, we can do the biopsy following that. That's something new that we've actually been doing. At the beginning, we've been doing a biopsy, and then if the biopsy is negative, we still do the MRI to confirm whether we can see anything in the prostate. If so, we can repeat the uh, biopsy in somebody uh, afterwards. 
but that's why we resorted to doing the MRI first to see if we can see something, and then when you go to, to biopsy, you actually target those areas. It's the less random biopsy. Can you do the MRI for all BRCA uh, patients initially, or is it done only after? Yeah. So, <laughs> for low risk prostate cancer patients, if you do an MRI, you will not see anything. And that's because in the low risk cases, the cancer is growing relatively slowly. Uh, it doesn't create a, a, a focus of cancer in a lot of patients. So as a result of that, even doing an MRI uh, doesn't show anything. There is something new called multiparametric MRI with uh, uh, scans that you do, nuclear medicine scans at the same time. Um, and they're trying to pick up the cancer location in these low risk prostate cancer patients. So there's a study in uh, British Columbia looking at something like that. There's SPECT scans as we call it. Uh, so they look for spikes in certain chemicals and locations on the MRI. Uh, but again, in low risk prostate cancer patients, uh, it probably is not going to add very much to it. Um, for intermediate risk prostate cancer patients, we do do it because in, in those higher grade cancers, you can see them on the MRI in most cases. Now, the reason that they're doing those uh, for low risk patients in, uh, in BC and in, there's a study in England also going on with that, and that's because even at the initial treatment for brachytherapy, what they're thinking about is instead of doing the whole prostate like we do now when we treat with brachytherapy is that why not just treat a focused part of the prostate instead of the whole prostate with brachytherapy? Um, so to do that, because of the random nature of the biopsies that somebody brought up, you're looking for other techniques to see if you can identify where the cancer is in these low-risk patients. So you could do what they call a partial brachytherapy procedure like we do for recurrence in the initial setting. So that's something new, whether that will take off or how well that will work over the next five years or so uh, is questionable. But I think that if those scans and those techniques were available everywhere easily for everybody, it would be a great thing to do. So for the uh, multi-parametric MRI, currently in Canada, is it only available in Toronto? NBC. And BC. And BC. Yeah. Vancouver? Yep, Vancouver. Um, so, because I, I, I just know a little bit about it, because uh, some of us would be on the uh, lower end of the list, but if you need to consider should I even go for a biopsy or not biopsy, and the multi-metric parameters would give an indication is it a higher risk cancer and where it's located for targeted biopsy. Um, so do we have a group of um, uh, physicians here that would you know advocate to bring it to Calgary as even a study or have it available? Um, if we ever get our new cancer center <laughs> <laughs> Uh, five, seven years from now, it'll actually all be in the new cancer center. Uh, until that time period, it's probably very difficult for us to get that uh, technology here at this point. We don't have the scanning capabilities, the uh, uh, abilities to build the nuclear scan, uh, tech, uh, isotopes that we need, and because of the short half-lives, we can't really do it in uh, uh, here. So. Uh, Edmonton, possibly, because they've got a psychotron there for, for generating uh, isotopes. Um, but in Calgary here, unless we get a psychotron, unless we get something, we're probably not in a position to do any of those uh, uh, tests. Now, with the new cancer center that we have uh, potentially we've built in, because I was actually on part of the planning committee for that, uh, we've asked for all those parameters, and the government had agreed to it at that point in time. Uh, there's even potentially a proton therapy unit that may go up in the new cancer center. Don't know any confirmation yet, but again, we've asked for that in the new cancer center. And if that does go ahead, then it will become actually a leading center in Canada. But we have to have that new cancer center to be able to do all this. I'm glad that you're sitting on that committee because I'm thinking the cost, you mentioned that you want to, to do one of these uh, multiple <coughs> But if you look at how many uh, needless biopsy you can decrease in terms of health dollar balance, 
Um, maybe this is one point that you can. Absolutely. <coughs> I mean, we've gone to active surveillance in a lot of people, and this would be a great way of being able to say to a lot of people, you know what, you don't need to have treatment. You actually have a very indolent prostate cancer and there's confirmation with this and we can monitor it better with other techniques than just simply a PSA, which is not really the best way to monitor prostate cancer, but it's the only thing we really have at this point. Um, so absolutely, I, I think as time goes on, we will be uh, improving what we're doing. Um, so at the meantime, if some of our members you know, are in that kind of uh, criteria group, um, if they speak with your, the physician yep. or yourself to say, can we have a referral um, to have it done in Toronto or Vancouver, um, could it be kind of discussed with the doctor? Uh, it, it could be discussed. We've actually tried to send one patient to BC, but BC declined it because they're limited to only doing a few patients uh, at this point and so they have their own patient group that has a waiting time period so they would not take anybody from out of province. Uh, uh, Toronto, we've not tried very much because I did try for one person and again we would decline uh, sending him there because of the uh, wait time and the fact that um, uh, uh, the government there wouldn't cover the government or the patient from here going there. And because of the time period it would go on the waiting list and unfortunately, because of the waiting list the way it is, he would probably never get done. So we've actually, that's why I've sent these patients to the U.S. For, for these things, because they can go to the U.S. and have these things done. The problem is uh, if they go, it's, it's a bit of a cost for them to do it. So, so which part of the U.S.? Phoenix, uh, Phoenix and Kansas City are the two centers that I've sent them to. Uh, at this point, the one in uh, the one in Kansas City is a different one. It's a newer scanning system, and probably a better one than the one in Phoenix. Uh, so that's why I've sent some patients to the uh, Kansas City. It's a carbon 11 acetate scan that they do there, versus the choline scan that they do in um, Phoenix. That same choline is actually what's used in the multiparametric MRIs with the SPECT scanners. What time? In U.S., oh, you can have it done. The last person I sent to Kansas City, actually, I just got a report on him back on my desk today. Uh, his time, it was a three-week wait for him to get into uh, Kansas City for the scan. It's two and a half thousand U.S. So, <laughs> so may I ask one, one more yeah. question? Uh, what is available at the South Health Campus? Because it says MRI. Yeah. It's a, OT. Yep. So how is it different from the it's, it's the, it's the, no, the multiparametric is you do a spec scan as well as the MRI. The problem is we can do the MRI but we can't do the spec scan which is a choline scan that goes along with it. That's the part that we can't do here in Calgary at this point. The MRI scan is a three tesla, it's just a stronger magnet so it gives a, a high definition view of the process. It's like looking at your high definition TV versus a regular uh, image on your TV. So that that's right. So that's what we have in Calgary. At least we've got that new 3 Tesla, which allows us to see the prostate really well. Un until we had that, which only came up about two years ago, I was actually sending patients to BC for private MRI scans with the 3 Tesla, which was available on a private system over there. And it was costing them about $1,500 to get the MRI done there in BC. But at least they could have it done, bring the images back so that it would help me decide what I needed to do for people. But now it's free because it's at South Campus. Thank you. All right. Any other questions? This is uh, something else. When you show the CT scan with that person with the bone cancer, and then no cancer, or your yes, that, that was the bone scanner. What did they use to get rid of the cancer? Then? <laughs> it was chemotherapy. It was actually taxotere. Taxotere chemotherapy, which is what. Yeah, which is the commonest chemotherapy that's used at this point in time. Now that was a, a unique response in that one patient, so that's great. Now how long he'll stay controlled, um, don't know. But you know, the fact that he's actually doing very well tells us that we are being more aggressive with prostate cancer and we can do more for people today than we could 20 years ago. And I think when I walked in, I was just talking to some people and I said, you know, there's this big controversy about PSA, which I don't want to get into. but. Uh, 20 years ago when I first started treating prostate cancer, 
you know, all the people that I would see, a lot of the people would die within five years of seeing them because we didn't have effective therapies and they were all being diagnosed at later time periods. Uh, now, it's rare that you're going to die with prostate cancer within 10 to 15 years of diagnosis. So that's how much of a change has occurred over these years. My fear is that if we stop doing PSA and uh, we're going to go back to 20 years ago where everybody we're seeing um, comes in with an advanced prostate cancer. Even today, with the, uh, the fact that PSA screening is out there, every month or every two months at least, I will see a patient with a PSA of over a thousand. And that's every two months I'll see one person with that. The highest P PSA that I've seen on a patient, 29,000. So, and what happened to that patient? <laughs> he lived a year before he uh, unfortunately passed away from the cancer. But uh, he, he did come down to 12,000 with hormonal therapy. But, uh, Unfortunately, we couldn't do very much at that point. But that's the fear of what we could be potentially heading to. So on that note, I should say, stop saying something, otherwise I'll be looking for a job in the U.S. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right.